morning, Her Serene Highness, Mr. Vice Prime Minister, Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. I have a pleasure to welcome you here at Charles University in Prague. I would like to pass to you cordial greetings of the Rector of Charles University, Professor Dr. Tomáš Zima, who is very sorry not to join us today, but he is currently visiting China. Charles University, being founded in 1348, belongs to the oldest universities in Europe, and we are very proud that in the year 2016, we will be celebrating the 700th anniversary of the birth of the Emperor of Holy Roman Empire and Czech King Charles IV. But the university is looking ahead and aims to be not only one of the oldest universities, but also one of the most dynamic research universities in European research area playing important role in the preparation of young generation for the challenging of 21st century. Charles University with its 17 faculties has currently 53,000 students. 7,000 of them are foreigners. They are studying in 300 study programs with 642 specializations. 16,000 students are enrolled in each year at lifelong learning programs. Charles University is connected with more than 200 prestigious universities from all continents in the network serving for the development of students and professors exchanges and scientific purposes. <laughs> Special attention is devoted to young generation, to young scholars. In the framework of postdoc programs, the university is presenting scholarships for international young scholars. Many of them are staying at the university afterwards. International cooperation and internationalization belongs to one of the core priorities of our university. Charles University, for instance, succeeded in 113 projects of seventh framework program of the European Commission and several prestigious ERC grants. We are now actively preparing projects in the framework of Horizon 2020 and Erasmus+. The history of czech Liechtenstein relations was very rich, and the speakers of today's morning session, representing academia and diplomacy, will devote to it their contributions. It was three years ago when His Serene Highness Prince Hans Adam II introduced his book and its Czech translation, The State in Third Millennium, to the students of Charles University. Majority of them were students of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I had a privilege to moderate the debate. The interest was enormous, the debate vivid and enriching. Thank you very much for the same privilege now when the dear and distinguished guests are visiting Charles University. I do believe that this is the beginning of a mutual cooperation. Vaše excelence, dámy a pánové, je pro mě opravdovou radostí a ctí, že vás mohu pozdravit u příležitosti tohoto Lichtenštejnského dne na Karlově univerzitě. Historicky, kulturně jsme propojeni. 
Česká republika a Liechtensteinsko patří k sobě a myslím si, že na bázi spolupráce, kterou máme, je dobré postupovat i do budoucna právě na základě těchto historických vazeb. A kultura je právě ono zarámování, které staví mosty mezi lidmi i národy. Takže všichni vítejte. Excelenzen, meine Damen und Herren, Vertreter der akademischen Kommunität, es ist für mich eine große Ehre und Freude, dass ich bei diesem Liechtenstein-Tag an der Karls-Universität begrüßen kann. Es ist mir ganz klar, dass wir also zusammengehören. Das Fürstentum Liechtenstein und die Tschechische Republik gehören zusammen. Wir sind eng verbunden, geschichtlich, kulturell und das ist auch gut so. Und wir müssen auch in die Zukunft Hand in Hand gehen und die Kultur baut die besten Brücken zwischen den Völkern und Nationen. Also noch einmal herzlich willkommen hier in Prag und ich freue mich auf das Programm. Danke sehr. Your Excellencies, Your Serene Highness, dear ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, I would like to thank to the Charles University and the Embassy of the Principality of Liechtenstein to the Czech Republic for accepting the proposal of the Historic Association Liechtenstein to organize the Liechtenstein Day. Today, we can see this, that the program attracted a high attention. Thank you. It gives me really great pleasure to make a presentation of, I do believe, one of the most interesting countries in the world. The Principality of Liechtenstein is interesting not only because of its history or nature beauties, but also because of successful transformation from agriculture-based country to the one of the most high-tech industrialized countries in the world. The countries can be also an uh, example how to manage the state duties and how to implement the direct democracy principles. Liechtenstein has a very attractive location on the banks of the river Rhin between the Switzerland and Austria. Despite its small size of only 166 square kilometers, its 38,000 citizens enjoy one of the highest standards of living in the world. With uh, 137,000 US dollars per capita, uh, this is, for instance, four times more than in the Czech Republic. In the Middle Ages, on the site of present principality were county of Vaduz and domain Schellenberg, 300 kilometers to the north. In Lower Austria, near of Vienna, around 1130, Hugo von Petronell built Castle Liechtenstein, and he called himself after it. The Liechtensteins played an important role in Habsburg monarchy. They are also one of the oldest Moravian aristocratic families because 765 years ago, in 1249, Heinrich I von Liechtenstein received Castle Mikulov in South Moravia as a gift from the Czech king for his faithful service in Austria. To the highest policy, the Liechtensteins entered thanks to the Carl I who was rich man and very successful politician and courtier. In 1608, for his merits, he was elevated to the status of prince in, 19, in 1621 to the imperial princess. And in 1614 and 1623, he acquired Duke of Opava and Principality of Kernov and Silesia. Since then, on the coat of arms, the coat of arms of Opava and uh, Kernov are part of the coat of arms of the Liechtensteins, and later became the part of the state emblem of Principality of Liechtenstein. So we can say that the symbols of the, of the part of the Czech Republic, uh, the, the, the countries are of the state symbol of foreign country. I would say this is one kind of the rarity. In 1633, Carlos' brother, Gunda Karp von Liechtenstein received a privilege according to which his Moravian domains were promoted to titular imperial principality Liechtenstein, but it disappeared in the half of the 17th century. At that time, the reigning prince was Johann Adam I, a successful economist, president of the first Austrian state bank, Banco del Giro, and patron of arts. For example, he built two baroque pharaohs of Vienna, the city 
and Garden Palais of Liechtenstein. In 1699 and 1712, he purchased for unbelievable amount of money to small, poor, and independent countries within the Holy Roman Imperium, uh, domain of Schellenberg and county of Vaduz. In 1719, the Emperor Karl VI unified both of them and elevated them to the rank of imperial principality under name Liechtenstein. In this way, the principality of Liechtenstein was uh, established. Because the country was poor, the Liechtensteins were obliged, obliged by the emperor to finance its state budget from their domains in Moravia, what they did until 1945. The principality of Liechtenstein was established as the 353rd and last independent territory of the Holy Roman Imperium, and as only one, it still exists in its original boundaries and name. This is not the case, for instance, for Bavaria or Saxonia and many others. In 68, after the dissolution of the Holy Roman Imperium, after the Battle of Austerlitz, the Principality of Liechtenstein became a fully sovereign state. Feldmarschall Prince Johann I, reigning at the time, was a successful military leader and diplomat during the Napoleonic Wars. He built the foundation of the Garden of Europe, Lednice Valtice area, since 1996 UNESCO monument. His grandson, Prince Johann II, called the good, reigned, reigned 71 years. He generously supported the scientific and cultural projects and was one of the greatest philanthropists in Europe. So during the First World War, the Principality was a neutral country, and after the collapse of Austrian-Hungarian monarchy, the Principality began to closely cooperate with Switzerland and formed customs, monetary, and post-union in the early of the uh, 1920s. After the Anschluss of, Fran of Austria and death of Prince Franz I in June 1938, new reigning Prince Franz Josef II moved from Vienna and Moravia to neutral Liechtenstein. In March 1939, the Principality successfully defended to the attempt to be contacted with the, with the Third Reich. So the Principality was a neutral country during the Second World War, but in 1945, assets of the 34 Liechtenstein citizens, including several members of princely family in Czechoslovakia, were expropriated without com compensation. This was the reason why diplomatic relations were suspended over 60 years. In 1945, the Liechtenstein suddenly lost 70% of their assets, and therefore economic reforms of Liechtenstein and family assets were necessary. In the 20th century, the Principality became more active on international scene. Since 1990, it opened eight embassies and permanent missions and eight honorary consulates. In all two countries, the diplomatic and consular interests of the, of the Principality are represented by Switzerland. Since 1919, Liechtenstein is a member of the United Nations and it's also a member of OECD, uh, EFTA, uh, World Trade Organization and many other institutions. I would like to point out that, that according to the OECD statistics, Liechtenstein is one of the most generous donors, donating three times more than its OECD average. The Principality is a constitution uh, monarchy. The constitution also sets out two methods of direct democracy, the initiative and the referendum. Since 1989, head of the state is His Serene Highness, the Prince Hans Adam II. His wife, Princess Maria, has born in Comte, uh, as a Countess of Kinski in Prague, about 300 meters from here, in a Kinski Palais on the Old Town Square. In August 2004, Prince Hans Adam II appointed his son, hereditary Prince Alois, as his permanent deputy. Important part of the uh, Liechtenstein legacy and part of the Liechtenstein cultural diplomacy are also princely collections in Vaduz and Vienna, totaled over 1,700 masterpieces of art. Temporary exhibitions are presented abroad. Four years ago, one of such exhibitions was also in Prague in Wallenstein Palais. Principality of Liechtenstein is one of the most highly industrialized countries in the world. 
industry and machinery represent 37% of GDP, much more than, for example, in Germany, Switzerland, or Austria. In the Czech Republic, the industry generates 38% of GDP. About 55% of the national product uh, represents financial and general services. Many industrial companies are highly specialized and have become global leaders. The country is a stable business location with a highly diversified economy comprising over 4,000 businesses and 36,000 employees, nearly the same number as the number of inhabitants. Half of them commute daily from Switzerland and Austria. If we look at the structure of income in Liechtenstein, we can find an interesting fi fact. The highest salaries in the country have employees of the education sector. Why? Because the government quite well know that only quality education can assure the future of the country, any country. Liechtenstein is one of the debt-free countries in the world. With a high level of political continuity and stability, liberal law and minimal bureaucracy. The state is here to serve the citizens. And I think that uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm presenting the, this country here, because we also can learn a lot from the principality. Even if it's a small country, it's a country where the things really work. The excellent education, social and health system make the country a good place for living. It is also not surprising that the Principality is also one of the safest countries in the Europe. What will be the principles of the Liechtenstein success in the future? I believe that they will be the same as in the past 40 years. Those include constitution and direct democracy, effective state administration, responsible spending of public money, and quality education. All this will be crowded by neutrality, a credible and reliable foreign policy, protection of human rights, and international assistance. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, when I was asked to make a speech at this event, I hesitated briefly. I do not use the English language often, and therefore I would like first off to apologize for imperfection in my presentations. It is also the reason why I would prefer to answer any of your questions in German or in Czech. The history of czech uh, Liechtenstein relation is rather short. In September 2009, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Liechtenstein, Aurelia Frick, arrived in Prague. She and uh, then Czech Foreign Minister Jan Kohout signed a declaration on the establishment of diplomatic relations and a memorandum of understanding. It was only at that moment <coughs> that normal relations between the two countries began, although the two states had more in common than it may have seemed. The mutual relations over the past 100 uh, years have indeed been very complicated. The Liechtenstein family has been involved in Czech history in many aspects, both positive and negative. Undoubtedly, it was always of the most important aristocratic families in Europe. Since 1719, the dynasty has had its own state, and it was a fully sovereign state from the start of the 19th century. Its larger, uh, largest properties, however, were always to be found outside the Liechtenstein Principality, that is mostly in Bohemia and Moravia. The Liechtenstein family was always very close to the Habsburgs. Sadly, the Czech public knows very little about Liechtenstein. This country is generally, and often wrongly, associated with tax havens and financial centers. People know next nothing about its history. We know Liechtenstein rulers from the Thirty Years' War, for example, Karl von Liechtenstein. We know about their property in Moravia. Czechs are familiar with the restitution claims of Prince Hans Adam. Interestingly, though, 
the family activities in the first half of the 20th century and property confiscation after 1945 are often related to the Sudeten issue. However, not many Czechs are able to differentiate between the interests and attitudes of the Liechtenstein dynasty and the other German-speaking population of Czechoslovakia at the end of the Second World War. This stereotype is also parallel with the, with the opinion of the Czech public of the Liechtenstein family as dead allies of the Habsburgs, allies who at uh, the second half of the 19th and early 20th century failed to find their way to the Czech national camp and therefore allied with Germans. As a result, the family was punished by having its property confiscated and its family members expelled like other Czechoslovak German speakers. All the above mentioned reasons and especially the legalization of the first uh, land reform were the reason why in 1980 Czechoslovakia recognized neither the sovereignty of the Prince of Liechtenstein nor the existence of independent Liechtenstein. Diplomatic relations were not re-established until 1938. The revival, however, did not, uh, did not uh, live through the dissolution of Czechoslovakia in March 1939, when Switzerland closed its embassy in Prague. Nevertheless, Vadus never uh, acknowledged the establishment uh, of the protectorate. It was, uh, it was not until the start of 1945 that Vaduz established relations uh, with the, the exiled government in London, but diplomatic relations were not renewed. In fact, the confiscation of Liechtenstein property in 1945 widened the chasm between the two states which not have been able to overcome it to date. Mutual relations were officially addressed at 2009 when Prague, Vaduz, ties began to improve immensely. A revival was clearly indicated in the foundation of a Czech Liechtenstein Commission of Historians in 2009. The objectives were not clearly defined, but pragmatically, the Commission had focused on the description and interpretation of history uh, both in the terms of the relation between the two countries and in terms of the connections of the Liechtenstein family to the Czech land. At the start of its operation, the Commission was divided in two sections, one Czech and one Liechtenstein, with two co-chairmen. The chairman of the Czech section is Professor Tomáš Konos of Masaryk University in Brno. The chairman of Liechtenstein section is Dr. Peter Geiger of the Liechtenstein Institute in Bendern. Among other members of the Czech section are Dr. Eliška Fučíková, art historian, Dr. Ondřej Novák, law historian, and myself. In three years, the commission organized several joint and separate meetings which took place in the Czech Republic, Austria and Liechtenstein at four international conferences. The themes of the conferences varied, for example, the history of art, memorial sites in our shared history, or Liechtenstein and Czechoslovakia in the 20th century. As the professional background of the members of, com uh, of the commission did not suffice to cover all areas of interest, Many specialists were invited to collaborate in the studies. In the Liechtenstein section, uh, these were, for example, historian Rupert Quaderer and political scientist and diplomat Roland Marxer. In the Czech section, it was historian Václav Horčička, who is now undoubtedly the biggest expert in the Czech Liechtenstein relation in the 20th century and the author of the monograph Liechtensteins in Czechoslovakia. Clearly, the Commission has not been able to address all issues of countries' mutual relation and could not resolve all the controversial issues involved. Uh, it goes with, without saying that transforming historians' views about modern history is much simpler than getting the majority of the society, much less the political elite, to accept new information. So the issues which have not been resolved are mostly the problems uh, that came into being uh, in the 20th uh, century 
primarily the confiscation of Liechtenstein property in 1945. In 2009 already, when diplomatic relations with Liechtenstein were resumed, Liechtenstein stated that the Liechtenstein family had not abandoned their property claims. A similar states, uh, statement was made by Prince Hans Adam in 2004, saying in an interview, uh, interview for the Czech internet paper Britske Listy that he requested the restitution of the confiscated property. He said something very similar while on a trip uh, to South Moravia in 2009. Despite this misunderstanding between Prague uh, and Vaduz, several mutual projects have been created. Whether this be the uh, aforementioned Czech Liechtenstein Commission or the exhibition in Prague in 2010, entitled Classicism and Biedermeier from the Principalities Collection, the establishment of close cooperation between the Faculty of Arts of Charles University and uh, the Liechtenstein Institute in Bandern, or today, Liechtenstein's Day. Let us hope that our cooperation will continue to develop in the coming years. Thank you for your attention. I'm sorry, this is a new book from the Czech Liechtenstein Commission. Thank you very much for your contribution. So we heard from two Czech speakers how complex and complicated our mutual history is. Thank you very much, um, Vice uh, Rector Professor Rovno, for this uh, kind introduction. Distinguished Vice Prime Minister Dr. Zwiefelhofer, distinguished Minister of um, Culture um, Mr. Hermann, distinguished Vice Deputy Foreign Minister um, Rudolf Jindrak, Excellencies, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor and a pleasure for me to be speaking here today on Czech Liechtenstein relations. I am grateful to you for your interest in Liechtenstein, and I am grateful to Mr. Jurzik for his tireless efforts in promoting Liechtenstein in the Czech Republic. And last but certainly not least, I am very grateful to Charles University for once more hosting an important event on Liechtenstein. I may say that Charles University together with Masaryk University, are definitely developing into hubs on research on the Principality of Liechtenstein and, for that matter, also on Czech-Liechtenstein relations. This is remarkable in many ways, and I just learned today that one of our princes, Johann Adam I, has studied at this university as well. So I think this is remarkable. Three years ago, and you mentioned it, Rector Rovner, you moderated your, it yourself, our Prince Hans Adam II has been speaking here on his book and introduced his book here. It was a very vivid and interesting discussion. I was happy to assist on that as well. It has also been mentioned that by uh, Professor Zupanic and Professor Hochitschka, they both have been um, doing studies not only here at Charles Universities and in the archives in the Czech Republic, but also in Liechtenstein, um, in the archives, in the princely archives, and at um, Liechtenstein Institute in Bandern. So you see that this research is, is tightening every year. Today we will focus on Liechtenstein, its special features, particularly in the field of the economy and its unique relationship to the Czech Republic. Our relationship, and it has been mentioned, is well over seven centuries old and mirrors all the important um, political, social, and religious developments that have shaped our continent during this time. From today's perspective, it seems surprising that two countries belonging to the same community of values did not maintain diplomatic relations for over 70 years, in fact, as recently as up to 2009. Both sides became aware that it was high time to overcome this European anomaly. As Professor Zupanich has explained, we have put a lot of energy in exploring our common history, a history of predominantly good times, but it also had its difficult moments. It was the aim of the Czech ministers of foreign affairs, Minister Kohut and Minister Schwarzenberg, to build the foundation of our future cooperation on the solid knowledge of our shared history with its unique opportunities and challenges. In fact, the decision to establish 
a giant uh, Czech Liechtenstein commission of historians helped to pave the way towards the relationship of our two countries. And I don't know, but I'm sure that um, you, Minister Jindrak, will agree that um, as one of the architects of the memorandum of Czech Liechtenstein relations of 2009, that this was a very important decision by our governments. Thanks to the extraordinary work of the Joint Commission, we were given the results of their studies after only three years. Today, we are more aware than ever that we are no foreign countries to each other. We share a common history and a common cultural space. This would truly be special for any country, but for a small country like Liechtenstein that has never invaded any other country, it is definitely special when we come to think of the numerous lieux de mémoire and codes of arms on houses on the house of the House of Liechtenstein on many historically significant buildings in the Czech Republic and even more so in southern Moravia. This creates a sense of closeness and it is an obvious invitation to use the opportunities presented to us. These are no mere empty phrases, but rather very realistic opportunities that should be grasped and put into good use in future. We have started to invigorate this common heritage through some concrete projects, and we have also agreed to look into the desiderata of the Commission of Historians pertaining to further research on the more difficult issues in our common history. On the basis of this newly developed common reading and deeper knowledge of the past, the two governments can now dedicate themselves to the tasks ahead and ask themselves what they can do for each other and how they can support each other in the future. The commitment to solidarity is the essence of the Europe we have all committed ourselves to be building. It is obvious that our two countries are quite different. Today, the Czech Republic is a strong member of the European Union and a very engaged member of NATO. The way to its freedom and independence has been long and arduous. We in Liechtenstein admire the courageous path of the Czech people that they have been taking in 1998 and maintained until this present moment, especially when it comes to defending liberty and independence on the European continent or in other crisis areas in our troubled world. This attitude is deeply rooted in your own experience and it bears witness to your deep appreciation for the values of democracy and the rule of law of, to mankind. Liechtenstein has been more fortunate in its modern history. Over the past 70 years, we were able to develop from a mostly agrarian country into a financial center and a high-tech industry. And we have also managed to further our system of direct democracy at a time full of democracy fatigue in Europe. Liechtenstein's people are well aware that they have been privileged in recent history. Solidarity and the commitment to the development of international law and human rights have thus been the natural priority of our foreign policy. In the same vein, my country is supporting the EU in achieving more cohesion throughout the Union by contributing to EFTA EEA financial mechanism. It was a great moment for me to be present when Strahov Library was reopened after years of ongoing restoration that was also made possible through EFTA EEA grants. Liechtenstein maintains tight relationships with only very few countries. First of all, there are our two neighbors, Switzerland and Austria, to which we are bound in deep friendship. Up until 1918, both Liechtenstein and the Czech lands were united by the same currency, the Austrian Krone, and by the same customs union. After 1918, also Liechtenstein gradually detached itself from this union and entered into a customs and monetary union with Switzerland. Today, we are connected to Austria and the Czech Republic 
through a, con a common economic area, the EEA, and through the Ch Schengen Treaty with its common border controls, and through a particularly lively grassroots level regional cooperation with Southern Moravia and Lower Austria. Apart from its in immediate neighbors, Liechtenstein maintains a special bilateral relationship with Germany and since 2009 with the Czech Republic. The basis lies in our common cultural heritage, in common values, and in common economic interests. Both our countries have strong economic ties to Germany, which is acting as a powerful motor for the economy of our two countries and for the region as a whole. In the process of developing a common agenda, the governments of uh, Liechtenstein and the Czech Republic looked into various aspects of bilateral relations and particularly looked um, in uh, the ways on how we could enhance economic ties. Within a year's time, we have been able to negotiate a double taxation agreement, which will be signed today by Vice Prime Minister Dr. Zwiefelhofer. We expect this to be a real benefit to companies. In the realm of foreign policy, the countries appointed bilateral ambassadors in 2011, and in January of this year, the foreign ministers agreed on a common declaration laying out further steps to enhance our bilateral relations and to open honorary consulates. We are very grateful to the Czech Republic for supporting us in some of our concerns relating to our membership in the European Economic Area. In return, we gladly supported the Czech candidacy at the Human Rights Council. And currently, we are exploring ways to co-fund foreign aid projects abroad. The cultural exchange, and you have mentioned it, um, Minister Hermann, between our two countries has been particularly fruitful and rewarding. Together with the other German-speaking countries, Liechtenstein has participated in the renowned theater festival of the German language in Prague. Austrian and Liechtenstein writers have together given a reading in Brno. Paintings from the princely collection, together with pieces of arts from the castles of Waldice and Lenice, have been shown at Weinstein Palace only a few months after uh, diplomatic relations have been restored. We are also grateful for having been invited to the pa Prague Quadrennial Festival next year, and we are very much looking forward to contributing to this festi festival with a scenography project by a Liechtenstein artist. The future lies with the young and the opportunities we are able to offer them for exchange and for a profound education. In this respect, we are well on our way. A remarkable number of Czech students have decided to study at the University of Liechtenstein. EU programs have proven to be useful in this respect. There is one conclusion that we can draw from the past few years. It is best to develop cooperation when one can build on an already existing strong foundation. This is, by the way, also true for the sciences. In our case, we have been able to build on a strong cooperation with the regions of Southern Moravia and Lower Austria. Often initiatives were created on the grassroots level and on individual basis. We attach great importance to these regional efforts because of their value for future relations, but also because of their usually high sustainability. When we resumed our political relations in 2009, the normalization of our relationship in today's Europe was at the core of our efforts. Today, only five years later, we are looking on a common agenda. We are working on the basis of common interests. We support each other on political issues. On the regional level, we are enhancing the economic cooperation and we have managed to establish a vivid cultural exchange. The 20th century was a century of tragic losses. It has been followed, despite of some setbacks, by a century of hope, freedom, and new self determined partnerships. 
the Czech Republic and the Principality of Liechtenstein have contributed to this noble aim and are strongly committed to continue their joint efforts in the future. And now I have the honor to hand over the floor to Deputy Prime Minister of the Principality of Liechtenstein, Minister of Economy, Justice and Home Affairs, Dr. Thomas Twiefelhofer. Thank you very much. Distinguished Vice-Rector, Professor Rovner, Distinguished Minister for Culture, Mr. Herman, Distinguished Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jindrak, Distinguished Chairman of European Affairs Committee, Mr. Beneschik, Distinguished Ambassador of Austria, Dr. Trautmannsdorf, Distinguished Ambassador of Norway, Mrs. Sletner, Distinguished Excellencies and Faculty Members, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to be here today, and we find ourselves in the August Halls of Charles University, founded in the middle of 14th century, merely 100 years after the known common history of Liechtenstein and the Czech Republic began. I could not imagine a better place to pay tribute to that common history and to look forward into a future of partnership and cooperation for the benefit of both our countries. I will therefore begin by expressing my sincere and heartfelt gratitude to Charles University, in particular to Rector Sima and to you, Vice Rector, and your team for hosting the Liechtenstein Day and for doing er everything possible to make this day a success. Thank you very much for that effort. From what I can see, this goal is already achieved. I would also like to express my appreciation to you in the audience who have come so numerously to show interest in Liechtenstein, a country that does not make the Czech headlines every day, maybe luckily, but has more in common with the Czech Republic than one would expect. We have heard about the efforts our countries have made together to shed light, to shed light on the particular and multifaceted nature of our common relationship. The result of the joint commission of historians are truly impressive both in their depth and richness. At the same time, the close look at our common history has not only been a useful academic exercise, it has helped us build trust and mutual understanding. This is an exemplary case where awareness of the past helps to build a successful and fruitful future. But there is not only historic evidence for the importance Liechtenstein and the Czech Republic attach to each other. As a case in point, I refer to the fact that Liechtenstein currently entertains seven bilateral embassies, in total residing and non-residing, of one which is our embassy to the Czech Republic. As we have heard from the ambassador, since the establishment of our diplomatic relations in 2009 and the mutual accreditation of ambassadors in 2011, cooperation between our countries has flourished in diverse areas including culture, education, and research. I very much welcome this development. For even longer though, our countries have sustained economic cooperation, resulting in common economic interests and a common viewpoint on certain economic developments. Today, I am here to appreciate this commonality. I will provide a more detailed and comprehensive account of Czech Liechtenstein economic ties later on. For now, I will simply illustrate my point by way of an example. Let me tell you that people here are not only in anxiously waiting for the new numbers of cars sold in Germany or elsewhere, but also people in Liechtenstein do the same. You are all aware that the Czech car industry is a pillar of the country's value creation. I am not sure if you are aware that, the Liechtenstein, that Liechtenstein finds itself in a similar situation. The production of car parts represents a significant share of our industrial production. Whoever drives a Skoda in this room can be fairly sure to depend on a steering column in the car produced by ThyssenKrupp Presta in Liechtenstein. I mention this fact to illustrate that a shock to the Czech car industry is not only felt in the Czech Republic, it can also result in short-term work and economic problems in Liechtenstein, like in 2009. In 2009, Liechtenstein has experienced to what extent its economy is integrated in the global market, as we have felt the negative impacts of the global financial and economic crisis. 
To be sure, the crisis has spared nobody. While some countries have shouldered the effects of the crisis better than others, all countries have known them one way or the other. We are still in the difficult process of adjusting the new financial situation. As a country of only around uh, 37,000 inhabitants, domestic demand for our products is marginal, as you can imagine. There is thus a natural limit to demand supporting policy measures. The government, with broad support of the people, has imposed structural reforms and cost reduction measures and initiated serious discussion on what duties and responsibilities should lay with the state. We are about to experience the first positive results of this exercise that is going to last for another couple of years, aiming at the balanced budget next year already and continuous years we are positively expecting balanced budgets. With a healthy public sector and sound framework conditions, Liechtenstein wants to secure and to ensure a sustainable future for its economy. What means imposing necessary structural reforms in a small country? How do politics work in a country that measures 160 square kilometers and has an electorate of about only 19,000 people? The reliability of a system of state can be seen in its legislation and application of laws. Liechtenstein is a state governed by the rule of law with a long tradition. State power is based on the Constitution. It is exercised on the basis of constitutionally enacted laws. As you may be aware, in Liechtenstein, the power of state is shared between the prince and the people. Being a monarchy, we, however, have well-developed direct democracy. Every decision taken by our parliament, the Landtag, can be revoked by the people. People have the right to have a plebiscite on every subject on public spending, on laws, on public building projects, and so on. Thus, doing politics in Liechtenstein always involves talking to the people, to be close to the people. The government tries to be in touch as much as possible with the people's needs. The success story of Liechtenstein and its economy depends very much on the hands-on approach of its policymakers and the dialogue between people, prince, and politicians. However self-determined Liechtenstein may be, we still depend on our various and fruitful partnerships with Switzerland and the economic, European Economic Area, the EEA. Let me elaborate a little bit on this point. First of all, let me admit that being a small state certainly has certain advantages. This is particularly valid when the state doesn't have to face the challenges of urbanization and it's surrounded by stable and secure political systems, as is the case for Liechtenstein, with its, which is truly positioned in the heart of Europe. This means, for instance, that we need not bear huge defense and security costs. That's a big advantage, of course. The country's geographic position and the fact that it's the only double landlocked state in Europe also means that Liechtenstein is naturally faced with less migratory pressures than others, in particular peripheral states. All these circumstances have in a certain way contributed to the ability of the country to avoid public debt despite the threshold effect of, for a small country which has to bear a comparatively large financial burden in order to provide the necessary features of proper statehood. The success of small countries in avoiding troublesome public debt levels has meanwhile drawn attention and more attention from large countries who are now showing an interest in the activities of small jurisdictions, be it, for instance, in the field of regulation of financial markets or taxation, in order to identify cooperative and non-cooperative jurisdictions. The main disadvantage of being a small state, however, appears to be that it is difficult to get your voice heard in international fora in defense of your national interests. This is one of the reasons why Liechtenstein strongly believes in the importance of playing an active part in European integration and international cooperation. It is in this respect that our EEA membership and Schengen Association play a key role in our politic. Liechtenstein is in a fortunate position to have no public debt and in having built up reserves even, which exceed annual public expenditure. This has come about through a kind of economic policies as well as prudent management of the state's finances pursued consistently over the past five decades. 
We had to recognize early on that we have no natural resources and must therefore rely primarily on business acumen of our population and the nurturing of a sound and business-friendly regulatory environment and a public administration in order to maintain a sustainable economy, a public administration who is very lean and very efficient. We recognize that given our size, we are latently more exposed to external economic and political influences and shocks than powerful large states. For this reason, among others, it has always been clear to the Liechtenstein government that it must pursue a very prudent household policy and avoid building up a debt burden that future generations may not be able to bear. It didn't take the current financial and sovereign debt crisis in Europe for us to realize that. We were very well aware of that for many years. The difficult current economic climate has merely strengthened the country's conviction that it must remain committed to balanced budgets and improvements in productivity. The EEA agreement is crucial, is very important for Liechtenstein. Liechtenstein is linked to the European Union and therefore also to the Czech Republic through a series of multilateral and bilateral agreements of which the European Economic Area, EEA, certainly is the most important and far-reaching. Since Liechtenstein has become a full member of the Schengen Area and joined the Dublin system in 2012, the country has made a further large step towards strengthening its integration with the European Union and we are very proud of that. After now 20 years of experience with the EEA agreement and several significant constitutional changes in the EU, Liechtenstein still values the EEA membership as overwhelmingly positive. While the EEA agreement has demonstrated a high level of stability during the past two decades, it has evolved significantly as well, both in terms of membership and substance. We need to recognize that if one looks at the contractual relations of other European states with the EU, the EEA agreement remains by and large the most dynamic and most comprehensive legal instrument in the web of EU relations. Of course, it cannot be denied that in the increase in the number of EU member states from 12 to 28 now, the simultaneous decline in EFTA membership and the successive amendments to the treaties founding the Union since the early 90s have all to some degree led to a certain political and institutional marginalization of the EFTA pillar in the EEA. However, the single market which forms the core of the EEA agreement has also ex experienced a significant deepening and broadening over the time. And this has improved the competitive situation for undertakings in Europe and also in Liechtenstein. The single market has led to a diversification and internationalization of the Liechtenstein economy, also the financial sector. Moreover, the EEA agreement has also allowed for stronger political integration of Liechtenstein into Europe. A drawback of the agreement is that the EU's single market rules often create an obstacle to keeping production costs low due to a persistent trend towards, I'll be very honest on that, overregulation. In these difficult economic times, the multitude and complexity of European rules that need to be complied with are admittedly becoming a more important cost factor in European undertakings than used to be the case. But what's the alternative? Actually, none. The development of economic ties with regions outside of Europe must be put into perspective for a country like Liechtenstein. Over the years, the EEA has remained the by and large biggest export market of our small economy. The proximity and size of the single market and the secured market access rights under the EEA agreement mean that the EEA will continue to have an anchoring function for our economy. It must be not underestimated that strategic risks for market access rise with the increased geographic and cultural distance between suppliers and consumers. Especially for a small country with no significant domestic market, geographic distance still is an obstacle that impedes the ability to draw benefits from globalization. The current difficulties reaching facilitations in trade on a global level underscore the importance of being able to rely on home market in the neighborhood. Enhanced economic integration on a regional level often turns out to be easier to achieve. That's why the EEA agreement is so important for a small country like Liechtenstein. The competitive pressure 
generated by the participation in the single market have also acted as a stimulating agent for the domestic economy in Liechtenstein. New business opportunities presented themselves, in particular in fields like the insurance sector, mutual investment funds, as well as the telecommunications sector. At the same time, Liechtenstein's EEA membership has not prevented it from maintaining and even deepening its very close economic ties with Switzerland. This has been possible thanks to the innovative and specific adaptations that are foreseen in the EEA agreement to allow for a dual marketability of goods in Liechtenstein. In other words, the EEA agreement has provided sufficient adaptability and flexibility for Liechtenstein to take part in the European integration process without discarding the need for special adaptations to take account of the country's small size and specific geographic situation. As Minister of Economic Affairs, let me now focus on Liechtenstein's economy. In the following minutes, I will give you an overview over the principles and key features of Liechtenstein's economic policy. I will show you how Liechtenstein's economy has developed over time into a highly industrialized and specialized regional hub, integrated into the European and international markets, and open for cooperation in Europe and beyond. I would like to briefly present Liechtenstein's economy under the following three aspects. First, local advantages, locational advantages. Second, export orientation and diversification. And third, the so-called Liechtenstein job miracle. Let me start with a short list providing you with an overview of the most important locational advantages of Liechtenstein. First point, availability of highly qualified skilled personnel and regional and international network to renowned universities, colleges, and research centers. Liechtenstein's education system is very similar to the education system of other German-speaking countries. Students even go, either go to university or chose vocational training. The system of apprenticeship is very much appreciated and also strongly supported by our industry. Big enterprises in Liechtenstein like to be able to train their own future employees. After the training, some of the young people proceed to pursue an academic career. This enables them to have on the one hand the practical experience from their vocational training and on the other hand to have the theoretical background as well. Liechtenstein is too small to provide university education in all academic fields. Therefore, we are part of the Swiss University Network and we have a treaty with Austria concerning higher education. Liechtenstein students are able to choose from any university in Switzerland and Austria. However, and I am proud about to mention that, we have also our own university at which economics and architecture are taught. Professor Schur, who is under us, will be presenting the Liechtenstein University in a moment. Liechtenstein is as well a member of the European higher education area and has been a founding member of Europe's Bologna process with the University of Liechtenstein being one of the first universities to fully comply with the Bologna system requirements. Another important advantage is Liechtenstein's membership in the EEA and the customs treaty in the same time with Switzerland, as I have laid out in detail above. Further advantages are a liberal employment law and little regulation in the employment market. Flexibility and rapid decision-making, a small country we are flexible to move fast. Ways are very short in Fatuz. Decision makers and economic players are in constant contact and try to constantly improve the frame conditions for doing business. We also have excellent international transport links. Zurich is one hour, Munich is two hours, Innsbruck is two hours. We are very close to big airports and we are excellently integrated in the um, transport system of Central Europe. Political continuity and stability is also a very important factor. I'm told by many industrial leaders that they appreciate that we don't change our government every second year, so we have a very stable situation. I think for the, yes, for the industry, this is very important. Strong capital resources and sound financial policy of public authorities, state reserves. Furthermore, Liechtenstein was one of the very countries to retain a triple A rating by Standard & Poor's, which has just confirmed again this year. We are very proud to be AAA, and uh, we do everything to keep that. 
Other advantages are a simple tax system with a flat tax of 12.5% for enterprises and an attractive IP box, and low and therefore attractive capital costs. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now move on to the second defining aspect of Liechtenstein's economy, its export orientation and diversification. Liechtenstein companies have always had to look across the border. There's a saying that a German entrepreneur one morning or one day said um, regarding export. He said, if I wouldn't have export, I could close my company doors on Tuesday at lunchtime. Well, imagine, as a Liechtenstein company, if we would not have export, you would not have even to open on Monday morning. We need export. Liechtenstein's home market is simply too small. Looking across the border has made it possible for good ideas, a flair for the needs of the market, and entrepreneurship and invention to evolve into family businesses, which in turn have developed into corporations operating worldwide. Some Liechtenstein companies are indeed world market or technology leaders, and we are very proud about that. It goes without saying that Liechtenstein's economy is heavily export-oriented. In 2012, direct export of goods amounted to 3.4 billion Swiss francs. This number does not include export of goods to Switzerland because export of goods to Switzerland are not captured statistically by the Swiss Customs Administration. That's inbound because Liechtenstein belongs to the Swiss Customs area in accordance with the Customs Treaty. 60% of direct exports of goods go to European countries. 18% to Asia and 19% to the Americas. The most important export countries alongside Switzerland are Germany, Austria and France. Among Asian countries, the most important are China, Japan and Hong Kong. And in the Americas, of course, the most important is the United States. Membership in two economic areas is a key prerequisite for the prosperity of Liechtenstein's economy. An export-oriented economy such as Liechtenstein's depends on discrimination-free access to foreign markets. I repeat, discrimination-free access to foreign markets. That's crucial. Accordingly, the government pursues a very active policy of concluding international agreements. To have a network of double tax treaties is essential for the prosperity of Liechtenstein's economy. And I'm therefore very proud and honored to be able to sign the double tax treaty together with uh, the minister today between Czech Republic and Liechtenstein in this afternoon. Our industrial businesses are active in many different market niches and thereby, thereby contribute to Liechtenstein's broadly diversified economic structure. Important branches of industry and manufacturing are mechanical engineering, I mentioned the car industry, tool building, dental products, vehicle manufacturing, food products, and building construction. And now I turn to the third point, distinguishing Liechtenstein's economic policy, the Liechtenstein job miracle. The success of Liechtenstein's business location is a substantial degree based on large companies. But small and medium companies are also very important and a very important component of Liechtenstein's national economy. The overwhelming number of the approximately 4,100 companies in Liechtenstein, namely about 3,500, are very small businesses with up to 10 employees. Only 17 enterprises employ more than 250 people. However, the large companies are important employers. They are the actual basis for the Liechtenstein job miracle. The 17 large companies in Liechtenstein provide about one-third of all jobs. With 36,000 jobs, Liechtenstein offers almost as many jobs as the number of people living in our country. Half of all the jobs are filled by cross-border commuters from Liechtenstein, Austria and the southern German area. The unemployment rate is accordingly low. In 2013, it was around 2.5%, and it's very stable. Another special feature of Liechtenstein's business location is the high share of employees in industry. The largest share of employees, namely 40%, work in the industrial sector. This is a high, very high level compared with Switzerland or Austria, where the share is less than 25%. I can therefore say with a certainty, Liechtenstein is an industrial location. With their subsidiaries, the major Liechtenstein industrial companies also create many jobs abroad. For instance, Hilti employs 21,000 people worldwide, with about 1,800 in its headquarters in Liechtenstein. In total, the 30 industrial businesses that are members of the Liechtenstein Chamber of Commerce and Industry supply about 42,000 jobs abroad in 65 countries worldwide. 
What is true for many European countries also applies to the Czech Republic. At the moment, there are three Liechtenstein-based companies working here. The Hilti AG, Hoval, and Erlikon Baltes. They employ more than 220 people in our, here in, in Czech Republic. Also, there is a lot of trade between our countries. Liechtenstein exported goods valuing 19.5 million Swiss francs from the Czech Republic, compared to an import of goods valuing over 13 million Swiss francs from your country to Liechtenstein in 2013. Let me end my address with some general remarks. Even with all our positive location factors, it should not be forgotten that Liechtenstein's resources are very limited. We have a lack of space and a lack of specialists. The surface area of our country, 160 square millimeters, cannot be expanded. The public and private sectors work to counter the lack of specialists by training our own specialists as part of our dual professional training system. Nevertheless, we will continue to rely, to rely on specialists from abroad. We need these specialists from abroad. This brings me to the end of my remarks. I would like to thank you again for your attention and for the kind invitation to be here. I'm very proud about it. And I'm now happy to answer questions in the discussion round. Thank you very much.